Hey guys, welcome back to another video. This is Motivation for Young Christians. Welcome back, welcome back. This is Bible Study Episode 42. Today we will be diving into John chapter 19, verses 17 through 27. Today we have Brother Gio, Brother Nate, and Sister Jillian with us. To begin, we're going to start off with an opening prayer by Brother Nate, and we'll be led by Brother Gio. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent in your, is your name in all the earth. You set your glory above the heavens. You are good. And your mercies are forever, and we just give you the highest praise today. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice of love. We thank you, Lord God, that by the wounds you've received, you've made a way for all to come to God. And Lord, we just thank you that uh, no matter what our past has been, no matter what we've done, you still love us. And we just thank you for the mercies and grace that you bestowed on us. As we dive in into the word today, as we dive into uh, the turning point, the, uh, the, 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 yes, yes, the turning point of, of reconciling mankind to God as we begin to dive in into the crucifixion, as we begin to dive in, as we celebrate this uh, season and this time, Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that uh, let your words come um, alive in us as we take a look into the beautiful yet gory experience of the crucifixion. The beauty was the reconciling of us to you. The ugliness was the being pierced in your side, being nailed and being humiliated physically, but you did it for our redemption. Let this be something that rings throughout the ages, no matter what age, no matter what generation we're part of, as we take a dive into the scriptures today, Lord God. We depend on your spirit to make it alive in us and to remind us of the power of your death, your crucifixion, as it is a part of this great gospel. And not, o- not only just that, but as we continue the journey on, we're reminded that you did also get up. And we thank you, Lord, for the cross, Lord. And your, the, the cross is ours, and our heart belongs to you, and we give you the praise. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Amen, amen. Now we'll be leading by... Let's get into it. <clears throat> John 19, starting with verse 17. Carrying his own cross, he went out of the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and went him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes divided them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this this disciple took her into his home. The beginning in verse 17, him having to carry his own cross and the weight of carrying that cross. I know probably some, most of the listeners will probably been listening for it, but yeah, we don't want to negate the, the fact that that was significant. You know, he carried the weight of the cross all the way to where he was getting crucified. He was basically carrying his deathbed on his shoulders. And it almost makes what he said when he was doing ministry, if any man will come after me, let him take up his, deny himself, let him take up his cross and follow me. That's in Matthew, and it's mentioned again in Luke. Bro, 
that it's heavy, but we got to carry it. You know, I, I, I don't want it to gloss. I didn't want to gloss over that. It just came back to me. Every man got to carry his own cross. But if they're carrying the cross and following Jesus, it's a worthwhile carry. Doesn't mean it's not heavy, but you, you, it, it's, it's a good carry. Um, in verses 19, I ask, uh, was there like a significant reason why Jesus was placed in the middle when they crucified him? Because remember, he was in the middle and they had two other people being crucified. It's actually a good question. I, um, I myself never looked into that. Anybody else have any insight on that? The placement of Jesus? Never thought, of, never thought about that, but it thinks to me it's like Jesus being the center of everything. Um, but it, I don't know, I don't think there's a significance, but it's interesting that you caught that. Yeah, I was going to say literally, probably not, but because the it, it's, it's something that all the writers of the Gospels kind of highlight and um it's like okay it makes colossians one make sense when you read further on there's always a tie somewhere by him being central you know even down to his crucifixion he was a centerpiece i don't know if it's because you know it was literally the passover season two and the jews wanted to make a statement but like it, it was it was played to me it was like it was played right anyway there was nothing they were going to do to mess up the moment yeah, I think like what Nate said, I don't think it's by chance he it all you know, everybody, all four gospels mentioned it. Um and they really like put emphasis on that he was in the middle and he had this sign. Um but like that's a good catch. That's a good eye. Um I'm not sure. Jesus is also, also in the middle in when mm -hmm. you say father, son, and holy ghost, he's in the middle there too. True that. And I also think about what was said of him in Isaiah 58 that kind of came to me as well, just to open it up to bring light to it, to say that he was numbered among um, the thieves, basically, counted among the rebels. And um, being in the middle could also signify that he was the worst of the three that was being crucified on that day. It's interesting. He was the redeemer of all. He was the redeemer of all, but in that moment, considered the worst of the thieves but that's isaiah 58 coming to life those little those little fulfillments that we, we, we sometimes miss you know mm -hmm. that's what kind of came to mind that you know he's numbered with the transgressors and it's right in the middle of it so good eye good eye Ezra. good eye yeah that was definitely a good eye bro all right thank you um the second question i have is for races 19 when Plato put this sign that says Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, and I know earlier we were kind of like if he if did plain to believe that Jesus was who he said and not, so I'm kind of wondering like why did he put this on? Wasn't it to like mock him? Because I feel like a lot of the things that they did back then, um, they were trying to mock God, like even with the crown of thorns, like you're the king, so I'm putting this crown of thorns on you. Um, because a lot of times when they did those things, they would pretty much like laugh and jeer him. An interesting thing too about that particular thing is, is it's crazy because the crown of thorns came from really the Jewish um, population, to my knowledge, I believe, and um, with with what Pilate wrote, I I I, I think about what we talked about philosophically a couple of weeks ago we were talking about you know he viewed Jesus as philosopher you know um for lack of better words I don't I don't know if it was Pilate per se himself mocking him that's just me I think probably what it was was just that Pilate wanted to prove his point once and for all listen should it come out that he's a king of the Jews I ain't do it as y'all <laughs> that was his last attempt to pass the buck Something because like when straight. the rabbis Right. When the rabbis, when the rabbi said, listen, don't say that. Say he claimed. And he's like, huh? I'm sorry, what? I've written what I've written. That's it. There's no more discussion. I gave him to y'all. So I feel like that was like his last cop out if you think about it. <laughs> he was just trying to make sure I don't have nothing to do with this. This is all on y'all. Please do not make sure my name is attached to nothing. 
I feel Definitely. like it has something to do with some type of fulfillment as well. I know, like, in the, in the Old Testament, um, like, the nation of Israel, they were really adamant about having a king over them, like all the other nations around them. Um, so I, I guess him him being crowned king of the Jews, um, I think it has some significance, right? Like, you see... Jesus of Nazareth, you know, where he was born or, you know, where he, where he's from his hometown. And, um, mm-hmm. it's almost like, it's like you're getting two parts of, of like who he was and or where he was from and, and what his destiny was, right. The King of where he started in Nazareth and now he's being proclaimed as the King of the Jews, but yet he's still being crucified on the cross. It's like, 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 like Joe, you said, it's like, mockery but yet scripture is still being fulfilled and if you notice too something for you to take with you as this event had global impact or what was perceived the globe at the time if you paint the if you cross the bridge the multiplicity of languages the hebrew which was the language of the country the greek which was the you know current translation and latin which was the official language in that time you, the, the, that statement was to ring out to and through for the world at that time. And you can already see, you know, those little things you don't even notice until you read it again. It's like, mm-hmm. that's something that jumped out at me as you said that, Gio. It's like, oh, wow. This, this, this is, that was, a, those were the chief languages of the earth at the time. Right. So he wanted all, everybody around the world to have been able to read it, what was, what was written on the cross. He's still greater than that. That's that's what that you know the, the church in me kicked the church he in me kicked in. Like, he's still greater than that. You could have you put that label on him, but he's still greater. <laughs> he is and he remain greater. Uh thank you guys for your thoughts. The next question I have is of verses 23. I ask that if if they didn't like Jesus, why did they divide up his clothes? Because remember they threw dice to um decide who gets what. So I'm just kind of wondering, if they didn't like Jesus, why would they take his clothes? Were they kind of renting his clothes for him, in a sense? I don't know, but Nate, what's the, the, what is the meaning behind like tearing the clothes? Or the I mean, dividing of the garments? Yeah, I know it's fulfilling the scripture because later on, it, later on, um, I think it was verses 27 or 26 mentioned that that's fulfilling the scripture. 24. Yeah, 24 is it. Okay, Google, so say, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it. Casting lots was basically almost like, <laughs> for lack of a better word, is like putting, putting up bets, seeing how much it was worth. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking back to where it was originally written. I think it's Psalms 22 and 18. And if you read Psalms 22, as around that 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 connects directly to what's happening too. The same verses in, in, in especially in Psalms 22, it's messianic. Um 22, 18 said they divided my garments among themselves. I'm reading from the um Holman Christian uh, standard Bible. They cast my lots for clothing, but you Lord don't be far away. My strength come quickly to help me. And if you just read through some of those things in Psalms 22, um you see a lot of the messianic undertones the connection because it was fulfilling that verse literally that they cast they cast my lots for they they they, they made money um from basically they're making bets on my clothes but it also could say you know it dealing with the heart of that nation at the time you know if you want to talk about how it translates but definitely for sure it was fulfilling that. Um, what was so, written in Psalms 22? So when I looked it up, it said the ancient practice of tearing clothes is a tangible expression of grief and anger in the face of death. So maybe they like ripped it because they knew he was about to face death and he mm-hmm. couldn't rip himself. I don't know. But it says oh, that's, that. That's good too. So yeah, so, so if you take that point, it says that they did not, it says, let us not uh, rend it or tear it, 
but let's cast lots for it. So if tearing the clothes, if tearing your own clothes was a, a, a symbolism of um, grief because a, a loved one died, in this case, they didn't do that. No, they didn't do that because they couldn't do that. Because if you mentioned earlier in the scripture, they did try to rip it, but because it was sewn together, they couldn't rip it. That's why they said, let's not rip, let's not um, rip it. Da, 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 da. I, I don't remember let's exactly what they said, but yeah, earlier, yeah, they, try to, they try to tear it apart, but they couldn't. Somehow, they was, it was sewn together where you can't rip it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's seamless. Woven from the top throughout. And the soldiers did that. Yeah, the soldiers, the soldiers did that, man. It's crazy. It wasn't, you know, at that point, it, it, I didn't think when I read it until I read it again, as though Psalm 22, 18, which is the original context of the verse, I was like, wait a minute. This Ooh. is the soldier's part or the soldier's part in fulfilling their portion. I'm like, the Jews didn't do this. The Roman soldiers them did. Okay, so I just, so this is what I found. So it says, I did the Roman soldiers cast lots for Jesus' clothes. Somebody believes that according to the Bible, several people have cast lots in Leviticus 16 and 8, Proverbs 16, 33, um, in Proverbs 18 and 18, and Acts 1 through 24 through 26. For things that did not involve Jesus' clothes, that's where we find renting of clothes. But its main use was to render a decision not biased and based on human choice, but letting God decide the matter. Mm -hmm. So that's what they're saying, that casting the lots meant. It's not their decision. It was God, God's decision for that. So going back to the purpose of, of all this having purpose with God. That's, that's an interesting take. You know, you can like dive into that. I think that's just a, a lot a good number of things on the side that was happening. I don't even remember we said this, Gio, that there's a lot of things that are going to happen, a little lot of nuances that's a part of the greater story. You know, the Roman soldiers casting the lots for the clothing. Mm -hmm. That's their part in the story of the crucifixion. I mean, they play another role later on. I just don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. But, um, you know, sometimes when I, when I used to read it, and it's like, you know, that's a good thing to always keep reading and read again, Gio, I realized that, wait a minute, these are Roman soldiers that did this. This isn't the, the, the Hebrews, this is the Jews, as I would have thought when you read Psalms 22 or looked into it initially, you know? And it also goes back to the point where, man, the world was involved in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I may be reaching, right? But just thinking about, like, um, Leviticus when... It was Leviticus or Exodus? One of those two where he spoke about the garments that the priest, the high priest would wear. And like the white represented something and the ephod or the ephod with the uh, the different stones inside of it, the breastplate. Like, I, I wonder if that had anything to do with it. Like, cause it talks about, and I went to, like you said, Psalms 22, 18 says, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know if like that, the garment thing might have some type of significance, him being the great high priest and, 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 and parting of his garments, but not being able to because of the way it was put together or seamless. Um, I don't know, bro, you, you what you're doing, Ash. Definitely growing, bro. <laughs> no, no more high level questions. I see that. You're really digging into the scripture and that's good. Like this, this is what it's about. Um, but like, uh, like, like, I'm Nate, listening to my bro. brothers. I'm listening to y'all. I'm just, Follow yeah. what y'all tell me. Like, like Nate said though, you know, it's like as you read, you'll see how everything comes together. Like, you you may be reading one time and you, you'll figure out the significance of why his garment was seamless and the fact that they could not tear it up and they had and they had to um, rely on or refer to casting lots um, instead. Could it have something to do with, so you talked about the priest's garment and um, the garment it says was also foreshadowing of Jesus that they wore who would carry out God's plan and atonement of true holiness and perfection. So perhaps that could be why one, they couldn't um, tear the garment. And then back to what I said before about um, 
like looking deeper into it, saying that the primary reason for casting those lots, as I said, was to render an impartial, unbiased decision on an important matter. So Jesus's death was an important matter to them. And then back then, once a lot was cast, no one could argue the decision that the result of human intervention, like nepotism or politics or favoritism or so on, was a result of them like, like wrenching his clothes. So there was purpose mm -hmm. behind the casting of the lots. Like they, they pretty much washed their hands with it like mm. leaving it up to God. Right. Uh, I don't know. I know somewhere in the scripture it it, it it will reveal itself. But that that definitely sounds like something that could be in, in the right lane. Now, that was a great point. So to bring in Ezra on um, that was a great question. Why was the betting important? Um the depths of the why you know, um, as Gio was saying, as we keep reading and we keep diving into the text, we, and also connecting those pictures and some of the things that just, um, uh, Joe was saying, definitely true to the matter. And it also gives you, I guess you could say it also paints the picture, helps you to connect the dots. You cross the bridge and see what's going on literally in that time. Then get the revelation of, or, or, and you see that with the crucifixion and you'll see further on in the crucifixion um, and since some of the verses we'll read next. Oh, okay. Got it. You know, so what you're doing is good, good, good digging, man. You know, I'm also thinking about the thing that hit me was just that again, the thing that, that hit me was just that it was the Roman soldiers that cast the lots. It wasn't the Hebrew people. That's the thing that stuck, stuck out to me that they played, played their part as well. And I mean, you'll see it come up again after his death, literally, but they played their part, you know? And um, it, and you can see the mockery in that, even in casting lots, the man is dying. If you just really think about it, even literally, he's dying and they're placing wages and bets on his garment, you know? It means he's worth something. Some guy be worth something, you cast a lot. No, definitely, no, no, don't, 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 let me, don't let me twist you the wrong way. Definitely, definitely. But I just think about it, like in that moment, you you kind of see, it's it's almost like, it's almost like watching somebody um, getting, getting, you know, the electric chair or something. And then while you're being electric, electrocuted or euthanized, you, you're, you're placing wages like somebody, a celebrity was getting the, the death penalty. I'm just thinking about that. I was like, some people be, that would be in the room be like, what, how insensitive can you be? But you don't really see that, I guess, that uproar in the text, if that makes sense. This when I think about this a little some this a little side note to think about too. Like, uh, what would they do with those clothes? Like, what are they saying? Yo, yeah, yeah, he died. Yeah, yeah. Would you? We gonna frame this? Like, I, like, what are you doing with those garments afterwards? Like, yeah, I'm about to put this on the 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 black Hebrew market right here. <laughs> <laughs> But the next question I have is for verses 27 um, was, why did Jesus' disciple take Jesus' mother into his home? Because I'm, I'm kind of thinking, was that like a fulfillment of the scripture? But it, it doesn't mention that it was a fulfillment of the scripture. So. Oh, Jesus saw his mother. Okay. Then he said to the disciple, here's your mother. And from the hour, the disciple took her into his home. Something that stuck out to me when I was reading that again. Um, even while he was just dying, there's a principle that I took from it that his care for those that would be helpless because, I mean, she's losing a son, you know, in the literacy of the thing, you know. But he calling us in the body to care for those that, that are helpless, even at, at ex people experiencing their worst hours. Some that stuck out to me. That was some that stuck out to me. He appointed John basically to just take care of her. And and also like digging deeper into that, like in my studies, it's pretty much saying that 
Jesus chose John to provide care for his mother because his brothers were not yet believers until after his resurrection. And you can find that in John seven and five, um, mm-hmm. Jesus's brothers weren't even present at his crucifixion. So Jesus right. entrusted his mother to John, who is a believer and he was present. That's like a big deal. Like if you're there, yeah, take my mother because I she's a widow. There's nobody around to take care of her. So John, I'm putting her in your, your, your care. And that's selflessness at its highest degree. As the man, I mean, Jesus dying, literally dying. And he's seeing his mom in anguish. And there's an important kingdom principle, I think in that too, as Julian said that, that we in the body of Christ really ought to, as the body, we, we care for those that may be disenfranchised because there might be different belief systems. The sons weren't yet converted, but she was gonna have to deal with grief. They weren't gonna be, they probably weren't gonna be able to help her spell it out or deal with it at that time. So the, the disciples, come on in, step up. Those that follow Jesus, you know, let, care about those that might not have the help spiritually that might not have the help or the resources to grieve or to, you know, that's something that stuck out to me as well. Like the body of Christ is entrusted for the care of others. And so my generation will have to take over the church, but. I mean, if you would connect that parallel, it's all about, it's all about, it's really about how well we teach and prepare you to care for that, for the generations, the elders and stuff like that. Because for me, that was something that was taught to me because the, 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 the shoulders we, they, we stand on when we do our present work, but they're going to need us as they um, come to the end of their journey, you know? Um, they're going to need us to deal with the challenges, to be there with them. Because sometimes there's some degrees of things that the family might not understand, but those that are believers, to help them understand and make sense of in the highs and the lows of their journey. I think if you learn that and embrace that, you're going to be just fine. Um, your generation will be just fine. If, you know, we learn the principle of honor and we learn the principle of caring for one another. We're going to be all right. That kind of passion, that kind of selflessness exists. It's just for that to come more to the light as we continue to be the light. So... Is the journey about to say something? Um, no, I was just trying to get more into like where Nate was going with like caring for the elderly, but I think he pretty much said says it. it's pretty much throughout the Bible that we're just supposed to be taking care, um, you know, of the elderly. But and yeah, the widows, yeah, yeah, the, the widows, widows children, so orphans, the widow, right. those that are helpless, whether emotionally or even literally, you know. And while Jesus is dying. He's making that a point. And I think that just shows the selflessness, the depth of his love, the depth of how much he cares. And then not only that, like, that's how we inherit the kingdom of heaven. Like, we have to be able to do all those things. Like, you do all this in my name, this in my name, this in my name. But if you're not feeding the hungry and doing all the things that God asks you to do, like, he's depart from me like those are the things he he's trying to just love and sacrifice and his death on the cross like exudes that love like we were pretty much helpless and he's trying to say like you're helpless however you are homeless or whatever um in so many different areas of life that you are in my death is showing my love to care for you. So now go and care for other people the way that I care for you. It doesn't matter what their age is. I, mean, look, I didn't even look at it at, like that. I didn't. The, the, that's, the, that's the thing about Jesus' ministry in his life. Down to the wire, he was leaving those nuggets. Down to the wire, he was demonstrating. Now consider that him being on a cross so limited and still being able to demonstrate selflessness, that's deep. 
because when you when sometimes sometimes some people say like yo on your dying bed you get unfiltered truth and stuff like that and and sometimes the, the worst of a person might come out because they just want to get it out of their system before they depart but just the simple fact that Jesus was so selfless to the end you know that 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 speaks volumes to me but that also speaks to the depth of what the crucifixion was the sacrifice the depth of love that he had for us god's heart was demonstrated so for us not to live that out would almost be a slap in the face to the crucifixion itself my few words about that in jesus name thank you for that going back to um verses 25 uh where it says that i'm um, standing around the cross jesus mother his mother's sister mary the wife of Caleb's, and then mary Magdalene. So, I know there's multiple Marys in the Bible, right? So, oh, first, okay. mm -hmm. so all three of the ladies in this position was named Mary. Jesus' mother, the sister, and then Mary. So, is Mary Magdalene the sister or Mary Magdalene somebody else? Isn't Mary the one that he met who was about to get stoned? She was pretty much, I believe if I'm talking about the correct Mar uh, Mary, who was a... Um, harlot of course you know she was a, a lady of that and um she <laughs> you know she was a little promiscuous out there in these streets and doing things she wasn't supposed to be doing um but god had grace on her and she was i believe the one who washed his feet with her hair and use the most expensive oils where you got Judas over there saying like, yo, like, are you serious? Like we could sell this for some, some coins here, but you over here washing his feet with your hair. So I think, I don't know what the significance of the name Mary means and I'll, you know, look that up, but it's, it's, those, those women were so significant. You have what Mary Magdalene, you have Mary, the mother of Jesus, and then you have Mary, who was the sister of Martha. Oh, I don't know, Nate, chime in. That's oh man, passing Mary. the buck quickly. No, I just think it, no, but I think it's just the, the the theme, and I think that's why it's good to not only just study one perspective. If you look at Matthew's perspective, the thing that's highlighted is that many of the women who follow Jesus from Galilee and ministered to him, so they had played a role in his life. And the fact that they showed and demonstrated their loyalty to be with him, you know, in his darkest hour also speaks volumes. I think when you think about it, you know, while, <laughs> while we're in the room, just how valuable and how loyal um, our, 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 love, our lovely sisters, our lovely ladies are to cause, to, 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 for them to still be with him at his darkest hour. They didn't. They could have just stayed at home and cried it out, but they were brave and they went, you know, and they were present. And um, that just speaks to the volume of how powerful his ministry was. Okay, so Nate, dive in a little bit deeper, right? So I looked up the word Mary, and mm -hmm. I think those women were so significant. So the word Mary can be um, Aramaic or um, and Hebrew via Latin and Greek. Now, there mm -hmm. are multiple meanings of the word Mary, but there's three. So like I said, I, I pointed out three Marys. I'm sure there was others, but the three Marys, I believe that their names were significant to all of these, these words I'm about to describe them as. So the meaning of the word Mary could be bitter. I'm thinking of Mary, um, the sister of Martha, bitter because her sister's not sitting there, um, you know, helping out and trying to do these things or whatever. And Jesus is like, or relax. Versus, flip it. The bitterness of soul that Mary was about to experience and being a, like really being a widow. Okay. Okay. But I, I tagged her with the other meaning of Mary as beloved. Oh, okay. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. Go All for right. It, go so for I tagged her with beloved. And then there's another meaning for Mary, which is rebelliousness which would have been mary magdalene interesting so there's and there's more that go on but i felt like these these were the top three that hit on the beginning part of it so um i was like oh maybe their their names are symbolic based on uh what they're doing like how they're significant in the bible got you i would have almost <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> I would have almost said, I could have flipped it around because I, I, I would say Mary, um, Mary, Martha, Martha's sister, I would say was the beloved because she sat at the feet of Jesus, uh-huh. almost s- scoffing what was the traditions of the day, which is the woman just serving and not getting taught, not getting, you know, um, not getting uh, the attention or being focal points of students, you know? Because usually whenever you sat at somebody's feet, that was a, that was, you know, student mentor journey. And you didn't really see that in that time with Jesus. Um, what was the other one that you said, Jill? Um, so there was bitter, beloved, and rebelliousness. Mm. I was going to say, I would have put Mary, uh, Mary, Mary Magdalene, um, Mag, ah, Magdalene, the, the rebellious, because it was her nature. I think she was the one that, that was the promiscuous one, right? Yes, sir. If I'm not mistaken. So, and then I thought of Mary, the, the um, Mary, the mother of Jesus. I thought of her bitterness of soul because of what was about to happen to his son. Mm-hmm. If you go all the way back and look at Luke's interpretation, it's just me. It was the, the, the faith to trust what the angel said about her son. And then to have that, what they call the gospel magnificent when she was talking about her soul magnified the Lord for the favor that she had basically of carrying the son that's going to change the world. And to see that, oh no, nah, that's this is not what I had in mind when I got the initial revelation of what my son was going to be. So almost like Peter, when Peter first heard that Jesus would have to die and he said in, in Matthew 15, he's like, no, 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 no. You ain't going to die, man. This, this, this is crazy. Man, Peter was trying to be Jesus because he had an expectation of him in mind too. I don't think Mary saw that as the picture. So that's why I, said I can associate the bitterness of soul. If we, if we were to go there, you know. Okay, but, okay. But that, that's some good stuff that you dug up with the significance of the name. I just was, I was just blessed by the fact that the women that accompanied him and ministered to him were present with him at the darkest hour. Because there's a lot of people in life when certain ministers and certain leaders go through dark phases and dark places, they're, they're absent. Not that's, even why, all the disciples. that's why women are a helpmate. Not even all the disciples, Ezra, not all the disciples were at the crucifixion present. Because if you heard, if you go back that night when he got betrayed, he was scattered. They, they scattered. Oh yeah, they fleed. So not all of them were present. Little moment of the crucifixion doesn't negate that they were his disciples, though. That's what that. I mean, that's another thing for another time when you get to the resurrection side of the matter. But the fa- these they were loyal to him down to the end. Yeah, Jesus knew what his ones would be. Like I said, little woman's history knowledge in, in there, like, ladies are loyal, especially when they're following a the cause and they see the growth of the cause. You know, just my opinion about that, you know. That's, I think that's also why, uh, unfortunately, the another conversation for another day, that the, <laughs> the loyalty can get so abused because it's in their nature to believe. It's in their nature to love. And so just a little thought for you, Ezra, is that it was the ladies that were there. But here's the thing about the ladies. It was the ladies that were the first messengers about his resurrection. Another conversation for another time. And you're going to see that as you read it. It's like, oh, wow. Women do play a part in the story of the gospel. Women has a part in the story and the advancement of the kingdom. Hallelujah. They do. Women are very important to the body, to change the body of God. Which Friday, in Friday video, I'll be acknowledging the importance of the role of the women in the church. With Sister Jillian will be in that video, and 17 other women. And we're just going to give the recognition that have not been given. Dope. And it started from there at the cross. At the darkest hour, they were present. And that blessed me. That was the part that blessed me about that portion. Consider verses 28 to 30. In your study, and when you look at it, especially this week, the it is finished factor. All the provisions was made down to the end. The providing post is um, death and resurrection for his mom. Um, it just Jesus was a real man, you know, like honestly, <laughs> he's a real man. And um, 
the crucifixion, we didn't even dive in all the way as we probably could because th there's more that comes down with, with this chapter and you'll see it as when I was praying, the beauty of it and the ugliness of it, like that, that we haven't really, really dive, dove into yet. We dove into the pre-events, you know what I'm saying? The beginning in verse 17, him having to carry his own cross and the weight of carrying that cross. I know probably most of the listeners will have probably been listening for, but yeah, we don't want to negate the, the fact that that was significant. You know, he carried the weight of the cross all the way to where he was getting crucified. He was basically carrying his deathbed on his shoulders. And it almost makes what he said when he was doing ministry, if any man will come after me, let him take up his, deny himself, let him take up his cross and follow me. So that's in Matthew. And it's mentioned again in Luke. Bro, that, it's heavy, but we got to carry it. You know, I, I, I don't want it to, I didn't want to gloss over that. It just came back to me. Every man got to carry his own cross. But if they're carrying the cross and following Jesus, it's a worthwhile carry. Doesn't mean it's not heavy, but you, you, it, it's, it's a good carry. It's a that um is a sad and like a there's just so much thing that you could use to just explain um Jesus crying carrying his own cause but I would look at it like that's us and the burden of the world mm. and Jesus took it all the way laid on well not laid would that be considered laid since it was like a stand up position um well he was laid on it but then they they propped him up yeah. He was laid and then propped up on it. And I feel like that's us joining with God, joining um together with God. And then he was mm. able to come off and be like, even though y'all separate, I'm going to still be with you. So that's the way I look at it. Nice. Sister Jillian, you have any thoughts? Carrying the cross. That and just anything in general. Um. You know, I think I, I, I was listening to Nate about carrying their own cross. And I started thinking about um, that's why Jesus could to do all the sins that people do. But he could relate in the burdens um, that we go through. And as we're carrying our cross and we're, we're seeing other people struggling, we have to carry that same empathy that Jesus has for us when... Uh, we see other people carrying the cross because we're so quick to judge. And I love that God, like Jesus, he was not quick to judge people on how they were carrying the cross or the specific cross that they were carrying. But he was willing to say, cast all your cares on me. Right. And just mm -hmm. I'll make your burdens light. So I love that in a sense where his cross bearing is symbolic to carry, but we can throw that down because Jesus is like, listen, I'm at the cross and I carried it for you already. You don't have to carry this anymore. Um, and through our words, we can speak life and we can now be free. So I don't know. That was just, I was just reflecting on Nate's last statement and just like how we tend to judge people um, based on whatever cross they are, they, they, they're carrying. And we try to say, Oh, the cross that they're bearing or the sin that they do is greater sin is sin um cross bearing is cross bearing um but we all have to push to the same destination um and if we actually stop um judging people's cross we can actually help each other uh get to the destination a little bit better and faster we can we can thank you so much for that thought to Jillian and to you too, and Nate, thank you guys so much for coming on this morning to be able to share your thoughts, opinion, and be able to answer uh, our question. Thank you guys so much. Now, guys, we'll be adding into the closing prayer. Do you Father, in the name of Jesus, we appreciate you. God, we adore you, we love you, and we magnify you. God, it was because of your grace and your mercy that we are not consumed. God, we appreciate the fact that you chose us. You chose us as your people. 
you chose um, to come down. You chose to die on a cross. And God, you chose to get back up again just so that we have the opportunity to one day meet you, greet you, and say thank you for all that you have done. But God, while we're here, we say thank you for waking us up. Thank you for starting us on our way. Thank you for allowing us to dive deeper into your word and get a better understanding of what it is that you sacrifice and what it is that took place and how it all with scripture that was from the past. God, we pray that you develop us you grow us and you continue to increase our knowledge and wisdom in you. We are insufficient, God, but you will continue to, um, that we can be clear um, when we express what your word says to others. God, that we are clear about our purpose, that we are clear about where you're taking us. So God, we say thank you. May we go throughout the rest of our day um, excited to know that you are right by our side, leading us and guiding us. God, we pray for Brother Ezron as he continues to promote um, your work, oh God. And as he continues to build his YouTube page, bless it and allow it to just showcase your glory. Um, in Jesus' name, we pray for all souls that are lost. If anybody is watching this and they do not know you, God, we pray that right now that they surrender their hearts, their minds, and their own will for your will, oh God, and that you may take um, a rest in their hearts and in their souls and that they are transformed and renewed and restored. We say this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Man, thank you so much for the prayers of the Jillian. This is the end of the video, guys. Thank you so much for coming back. Thank you so much for just continuing to come along in this journey. This is the end of Bible Stage episode 42. If you haven't already, like, subscribe if you're new. Turn on your post notifications so that way anytime I upload a, YouTube, a video, YouTube will send you the notification. This is Motivation for Young Christians. I'll see you guys next week.